word this morning? Anybody ready for the word this morning? Yes. Yeah. Come on, let's pray as we approach the word of God. Father, thank you for your word that it is life to us. That it is life changing and transforming. Thank you, Lord, that your words are spirit in our life and they raise us from the dead. And Lord, we just look for your resurrection power this morning in your word this morning. May it speak to us and may it bring hope and life again to us. In Jesus' mighty name, everyone say Amen. 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 The title of my message this morning is The Empty Tomb. Everyone say The Empty Tomb. The Empty Tomb. tomb. And what do you reckon most people think of when... They think of Easter, just generally in our culture. What would most people think of when you mention Easter? Come on. Chocolate, yeah, Easter eggs, yeah, the, the rabbit, the Easter bunny, yeah, yeah, yeah. My youngest is still deliberating on whether the Easter bunny is real or not. Incredible imagination, that girl. And uh, chocolate, Easter eggs, hot cross buns. Come on, any hot cross buns fan, fans? And, uh, and all these things, holidays, long weekend. This is what our culture, our society has embraced, really is what Easter is kind of all about. And really, I mean, these things are, are good in, in and of themselves, aren't they? I mean, chocolate, maybe maybe not so much. But, you know, at Easter, chocolate is, is good, isn't it? But when you think about the true meaning of Easter, all of those things, Easter bunnies, chocolate eggs, they all seem a little bit empty, don't they? Yeah. They're all a little bit superficial, a little bit empty. But when it does come to the true meaning of Easter, empty is a good thing. (laughs) Empty is a good thing. And we've come here this morning, of course, to celebrate the empty tomb. And yes, that is a photo from my actual Bible. (laughs) The empty tomb. And so if you want to turn to your Bibles to Luke chapter 24, we're going to go there in just a moment. See, but normally when we talk about empty or the concept of something being empty, it generally generally isn't a good thing. It's generally not such a good thing, is it? King Solomon, the richest, most powerful, wisest man in his time, he despaired that his life was completely empty, meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. He would write over And over, he despaired of an empty life, even though he had everything a man in this world could wish for. My first car was a Mitsubishi Mirage three-door hatch, 1,200 cc's of pure power. (laughs) And the petrol gauge didn't work so well. (laughs) And I have to admit, on a few occasions, we managed to run out of gas. One of those moments was I was driving around my old hood as I was growing up in Bucklands Beach and uh, the old car spluttered to a complete halt. And thank goodness I was actually at the top of a hill in my little Mitsubishi Mirage at probably the age of 19. We were talking last night how teenagers' minds aren't quite, their, their cognitive uh, part isn't quite developed completely. And I thought, what am I going to do in this situation? As a 19-year-old, my car has completely stopped. I've obviously run out of gas because my gas gauge is not working. But I noticed that there was a gas station at the bottom of the hill. And so, of course, I just thought, great, here we go. I'm just going to roll this thing over the hill. So I gave it a little bit of a push. And down the very steep hill in Bucklands Beach, I went down this hill. Thank goodness there were no walkers, dog walkers, or anyone going across the footpath. So I had to swing across the other side of the road and into the gas station just in time to get a gas fill up. But how many of you know when you run out of gas, it's not a good thing? When your tank is empty, it's not such a good thing. Have you ever been to the shops, supermarket or something, and you've swiped your card or swished it or stuck it in, whatever you do, I can, I can never figure it out, I'm kind of going like this with my card these days, trying to figure out what I'm meant to do in each situation. But you do that, whatever it is, and it comes up, those words, those dreaded words, decline. Come on, honest people in church, who's been there? Have you know, it's not a good feeling when your bank account is empty, and you make some little excuse and pull out the visa. <laughs> How many of you have been in the situation when uh, you've gone to put milk on your cereal at home and you open the fridge and you reach in for the cereal only to discover that the kids have put it back empty? 
and you suddenly got no milk and you had to head down the road. When you're, the battery bars on your phone say that your phone is nearly empty. Empty is generally, in our society, in our life, generally empty is not a good thing. And it usually brings about unneeded stress and worry and trips to the store. Uh, when it comes to things like our bank account, our gas, our milk, empty is not a good thing. When it comes to the condition of our soul, empty is not a good thing. But when it comes to Easter, when it comes to the empty tomb, empty is an awesome thing. Does anyone agree with me this morning? Empty is an awesome thing. When Jesus was brutally murdered, nailed to a cross, and someone, one of the speakers at Easter camp pointed out to us, in fact it was the barefoot bishop, um, Justin Duckworth, he shared with us that the cross was not an instrument of death from the Romans. It was an, in it was an instrument of shaming. It was an instrument of hanging someone up there to mock and to shame that led to death. But that's what it was for, it was to shame. And they hung Jesus on this cross, naked and bleeding, beyond recognition of a human. It would have just looked like a hunk of meat after they had dealt their worst to him. Hanging there on the cross for you and me. And then they buried him in that borrowed tomb, rolling the stone over the tomb, sealing that stone to make sure that his disciples didn't try to get his body and three days later, something unbelievable happened, didn't it? Something incredible. And the tomb was empty. Everyone say the tomb was empty. The tomb was empty. And let's read that in the scriptures and in Luke 24. Hopefully you're already there. And just let's read the first eight verses of Luke 24 to just catch us up on the story. And look, you might have heard the story a hundred times. You might be like me growing up in church. But I want to encourage you to read this and look at this with fresh eyes. Can we do that this morning? Let's allow this passage to speak to us afresh. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, I know about that today, the women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered... They did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you? While he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then the penny dropped, and they remembered his words. May we remember the words of Christ today. Why is the empty tomb so significant? Why is empty such a good thing when it comes to to Easter. I want to look at just three things this morning. First of all, the empty tomb is proof. Empty is proof. Everyone say proof. We like evidence in our society. We're a scientific people. We're a rational people. We like proof. We like evidence, don't we? And empty is proof. Let's rewind a little bit. Before the cross, Jesus repeatedly, he tried to prepare his disciples, didn't he? They had one ending on how the story was going to go, but Jesus tried to tell them how it was actually going to go. How many of you know the offer, we have one plan for our lives. We have our thoughts about how our lives are going to go, but sometimes God has a different idea, amen? And we need to tune into that. Jesus tried to repeatedly prepare them for what was about to happen, and we can read about it in Mark 8.31. It says, then Jesus began to tell them that the Son of Man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of the religious law. He would be killed, 
But three days later, he would rise from the dead. He told them in plain Aramaic, Greek, whatever he was speaking at the time. He told them clearly. Have you ever heard someone make a bunch of claims about things that they've done, mountains they've conquered, but then they've been completely unable to back up what they've said? And you kind of think, really? Sort of raise that eyebrow, really? Thank goodness Jesus was not one of those people. He claimed that he would be raised after three days from the tomb. And he backed up exactly what he said he would do. See, the empty tomb is proof that Jesus was who he said he was. So you can go and you can visit the tombs of Buddha. You can visit the tombs of Muhammad or Confucius, where their bodies, their bones are buried. But if you try to go to the tomb of Jesus, there's not going to be anything there. There's nothing to see. The thing that separates Jesus out from all the other religious leaders and great leaders of movements around the planet is that you can go to his tomb and there's nothing there. He is risen. He is no longer dead. Bono from the great band U2. Any U2 fans from way back? Come on. Thank you, aunt. I see that. I see that hand. Come on, Baz. He said this. He said, Jesus isn't letting you off the hook. When people say, oh, Jesus was a, a good teacher, a, a prophet, a really nice guy. This is not how Jesus thought of himself. You've got to imagine I've got an Irish accent here, by the way. <laughs> so you're left with a challenge in that either Jesus was who he said he was or a complete and utter nutcase. Words of Bono. You have to make a choice on that. And I believe that Jesus was, you know, the Son of God. Anyone else in agreement with Bono this morning? <laughs> Bill Bright, he said the validity of Jesus' claims about himself rests on the resurrection. Whether he rose from the dead or stayed in the grave determines whether or not what he said was true or not. Skeptics say that to believe in the resurrection is just blind faith. Little evidence, little or no basis of truth at all. And isn't that the voice of our society and this trend towards atheism? The skeptical society that we live in. It's just blind faith. But when confronted with the actual facts, however, the scientific facts, if you like, those who are intellectually honest, are forced to admit that the resurrection is an historical event based on irrefutable proofs. Let me give you just a few really quickly this morning. Number one, there, there are the prophecies. Jesus fulfilled so many flippant prophecies. There are hundreds of them. No man could have consciously uh, fulfilled those promises. There were things that happened outside of his control, like they, they gambled for his, his clothes that were not torn, but they were gambled for. It's in the scriptures, in the prophecies. His resurrection was prophesied in Psalm 16, uh, verse 10. Hundreds of years before Christ walked the earth, it says, For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. And that is exactly what God did. He did not let his son rot in the grave, did he? He was risen. There were so many, a multitude of prophecies throughout the Old Testament. Number two, Jesus himself predicted his own resurrection to the day. I like that. He, he prophesied his own resurrection. He predicted his own resurrection, then pulled it off. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Number three, the testimony of his followers, even when faced with torture and death. Many of us know Peter himself was crucified, but he didn't feel worthy to be crucified like his master. And so he said, will you crucify me upside down? And that's how Peter died. So, so many, it wasn't just the 12 disciples, but hundreds of believers in history have died Believe it because they were there. They were there. They saw the empty tomb. They saw that he'd risen from the dead. If they were making it up, do you think they would willingly go through torture? Do you think that they would really willingly give their lives for just a, a, a nice story that they made up? I don't think so. They might have been able to convince others to a point, but I don't think they would have given their lives unless they really believed. 
that what they said was true. That when they said, we've seen the empty tomb. When they said, we've seen the risen Christ and the holes in his hands. I believe that that is proof that it is true. And number four, of course, the testimony of millions of lives that have been transformed since. There are two billion people on the planet today who are going to be celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ as believers. Isn't that awesome? And because we're the first to see the sun, we're some of the very first around the planet of those two billion to praise Jesus. Who in this room could raise their hands and say, the resurrection power of Jesus has touched and changed the course of my life? Who can say that? Come on. There is proof right here. 2018 years after what Jesus did on the cross or thereabouts. There are many more proofs, but we don't have time this morning. The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he says he was. He is the son of God, not just a, a good teacher or a nice guy, as Bono said. He is the son of the living God. He has the power to forgive sins and he has the power over death itself. The empty tomb is proof. Secondly, the empty tomb, empty is powerful. You must say powerful. Oh. Empty is powerful. Because Jesus died and rose again, he finally and completely defeated the power of sin and death. We all know that for something to live, something has to die, doesn't it? Come on, who had a bit of fruit this week? <laughs> For something to live, something else had to die. When I'm cooking the dinner and my kids are like, what's for dinner? I like to answer cow. <laughs> Chicken, they hate it. <laughs> oh, dad. <laughs> but it's a reality, isn't it, in this life that for something to live, something else has to die. Well, Jesus is the one who died once and for all so that we could live and have eternal life. Amen. He died and offers us life. Sin's greatest weapon is death and the fear of death. How many of you know there are literally thousands of different phobias diagnosed these days? In fact, I, f I discovered one this week. There is a, I can't remember how to pronounce the word, but uh, it was the fear of being buried alive. There are all kinds of fears, fear of the dark, fear of heights, fear of spiders, fear of all kinds of unusual, weird and wonderful things these days. But do you know what tops the list every time is the fear of death. In a materialistic society, it feels so final. It feels so complete. It feels so scary in our society that so wants to live in the here and now that it, it tops the list every time. The fear of of death. But praise God, Jesus conquered the fear of death. The empty tomb shows us that Jesus has the power over death. He looked death straight in the eyes. He looked death and hell straight in the eyes. He took everything that death and hell could throw at him, even the cross. And then he rose victorious. Can someone give me a whip glory for that? <laughs> Come on, that is awesome. He didn't just kind of pussyfoot around it. He didn't just kind of change the rules on us. He looked death straight in the eyes. He looked that fear straight in the eyes that every single one of us one day has to look down that barrel. All of us have loved ones, those who have passed on, and we've had to consider this thing of death that feels so final and, and so much fear can come around that. Jesus looked at that fear head on and he defeated it when he rose from the grave. Amen. He rose victorious. How amazing is that? Empty is powerful because it means that life has forever overcome death. Light has overcome darkness. Love has overcome hate. And good has forever overcome evil. And so whenever you're watching the six o'clock news and you hear of all kinds of atrocities and evil being carried out in this world, you can know this, it is temporary. It's on the way out. 
When you hear of sickness and disaster and horrible things happening to people, even in our own neighborhoods, even in our own families, you can know this. It is temporary. Come on, can someone get excited about this with me this morning? It's on the way out, people. Death has been swallowed up. Where is your sting, Paul says? Come on, death, where's your sting? Where's that fear gone? I'm going to live forever. Amen. I'm going to live forever because Christ overcame death. We get to look forward to our future beyond the grave. Which brings me to my final point. The empty tomb. Empty is not only proof. Empty is powerful. It is also personal to every believer. Everyone say personal. Because he rose from the grave. So will I. Someone say so will I. So will I. One day, we will rise from the grave too. Paul tells us plainly in 2 Corinthians 4, uh, chapter 4, uh, chapter 4, verse 14. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. As Christ was raised, so you and I who believe and trust in him will be raised also. I'm looking forward to walking through those doors of death. How about you? I'm looking forward to life beyond the grave. A few weeks ago, we enjoyed hearing Ian McCormick's testimony. The man who got stung by five, uh, or stung five times by box jellyfish, which often just one can be fatal. And he eventually did. He died uh, in the, uh, he was in the Mauritius and he died in the hospital and he left his body. And I'm sure many of us have heard stories of people who say they were being operated on or they passed away and literally they left their body and could look back and see exactly what was going on in that room. But they were no longer there. They had gone because our soul, the real us, goes on beyond the grave. And we heard his story about leaving his body and then coming and standing before the resurrected Christ. And he said he believed that all if Jesus just simply uttered a word, literally galaxies would come out from his mouth. That's how he felt standing in the presence of the resurrected Christ. Amen. He's no longer that one like you see in stained glass windows hanging from the cross. That cross is empty. That tomb is empty, man. He is now resurrected. Because the tomb is empty, our lives can be full. Amen. Because the tomb was empty, our lives can now be full of hope, full of joy, full of strength, full of purpose. No matter what comes our way, we can overcome because of the empty tomb. It's easy, can't it, to get worn down in life, get weary get so busy, get tired. And it's the empty tomb. It's the resurrection that energizes us, that brings new hope and new life, no matter how dark life gets. If you were here last week and Josh talked about those puzzle pieces, no matter how bad the puzzle piece you just get handed is, and you think, ah, this, where's this going to fit? This wasn't meant to happen. This wasn't meant to be part of my life. The picture of my life. Where's this puzzle piece? No matter how bad that gets, we can have hope. We can have strength because of the resurrection, because of the empty tomb. The empty tomb is personal. Amen. To everyone who believes. So as we look at the true meaning of Easter and everything that Jesus did for us on the cross, empty, would you agree, is a good thing. Empty. Is proof that Jesus is who he said he is. Empty is powerful that Jesus has power over death and evil. And empty personally affects all of us who believe that as Christ was raised, so one day you and I will be raised. Why don't you just pop your Bibles down? Just stand to your feet in his presence this morning. Trish, you can't come on up. Well, somebody just close your eyes and we're just going to, just as we finish this morning, just dial into the presence of God again. 
See, because when Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished. It truly was finished. He completed the greatest work of any man, the God man giving his life for us so we could have life, so we could be forgiven and walk in newness of life. And maybe you're here this morning and you haven't received Christ personally. You might have heard the Easter message before. You might have heard the Christmas message about baby Jesus and you might know the stories. You might have hey, you might have grown up in church, but maybe you've never made it personal. You've never received Christ. You've never received the work of the cross in your life to where it could change you. I want to invite you this morning to receive Christ personally, to receive his forgiveness, to receive his life and grace into your heart. Hey, maybe you did receive it, but it was a long time ago. And you're here this morning. Maybe you're on holiday. And I want to invite you also this morning to come afresh and come back to that first love. Come back to that close relationship with Him today. So just as everyone's eyes closed, is there anyone like that in this room? Is there anyone who, for the first time, you need to take this from just being a story that happened thousands of years ago to something personal that's real for you today. If you need to receive Christ and His forgiveness today, I'm not going to embarrass you, but can you just raise your hand to say, that is me. That is me this morning on Resurrection Sunday, on Easter Sunday. I want to give my life to Christ. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I want to receive His forgiveness and His resurrection life. Is there anybody in that place this morning? Awesome. Thanks, I see that hand. That's one. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Maybe you wanted to come back to God. You, you know you're a Christian. You know you gave your life, but maybe it was a long time ago and you want to receive this afresh. I want to include you in this prayer. I'm going to pray in a moment as well. Just raise your hand as well, just very quickly. Just raise your hand. Awesome. God bless you. Cool, you too. Fantastic. That's wonderful. Good on you. That's two. Yeah, down the back. Bless you, mate. Anybody else? You want to come back to the Lord. Start afresh with God. Hey, church, why don't we all pray this together? I'm going to pray a prayer. And those of you who raised your hands, I want to particularly invite you to pray this prayer. Not to me, but to God, to your Father in heaven. He loves you so much. In fact, the Bible says He loved you so much, He sent His Son to die for you so that you would not perish but have eternal life. And you can receive that today. And others who raise your hand, you can receive that afresh in your life. But church, let's all pray this prayer. Let's pray, Lord Jesus. Come on, let's pray with faith. Pray, Lord Jesus. I come to you this morning. And I thank you for the cross. I thank you for dying for me so I could be forgiven. Jesus, forgive me for my sins, for everything I've ever done wrong. Wash my heart clean. I receive you into my life. And I thank you that you rose again. Now I receive your life into my heart. I am born again through the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Help me to follow you and get to know you more from this day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome. Just keep your eyes closed. It's where you are. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you're here right now. I just pray for a fresh of your holy presence. Lord, just release that resurrection life into every heart, especially those who prayed that prayer for the first time or coming back and receiving a fresh right now. 
Touch every heart. Touch every life right now with that resurrection power that rose Christ from the grave, that caused that tomb to be empty. Lord, I just speak life where there's been death. I speak life, hope where there's been despair. I speak good where there's been evil at work. In Jesus' name, I speak freedom where there has been oppression. In Jesus' name, be free. Be free. Thank you, Lord, for your great salvation, for your forgiveness. Now, I want you also just to consider as we just stand before God. Where in your life are you feeling empty? What thing in your life seems empty right now? See, because Jesus emptied the tomb so that your life could be full. He said, I come to give life and life to the full. Abundant life, overflowing is his desire for you. Joy, peace, life, wholeness. Where in your life right now do you feel empty? Maybe it's in your relationship with God. Maybe it's in your marriage, your family. Maybe it's in the area of your career and what's happening in your work life in the air of your destiny and the direction of your life. Where in your life right now do you feel empty? I believe that the Father this morning wants to fill you. If there is an area where you just identify, you know what, that area feels a bit empty right now. It shouldn't be like that. I want to be filled. Just put your hand on your heart right now. Just place your hand on your heart. Just place your hand on your heart. If you want a fresh filling. Yeah, that's it. Jesus, we bring these areas to you right now. Thank you, Lord, that that tomb is empty. We cannot visit your bones. We cannot visit the place of your death because you're not dead. You're alive and you're here right now. And Lord, for those of us who are dealing with life and situations and family relationships and little careers that have maybe crashed and burned or gone off in a whole other direction than we expected. God, thank you that you are here, Lord, to fill us. God, where we feel empty in the air of our own self-worth. Lord, that we just feel a bit worthless. Thank you, Lord, you come to fill us with worth, with love. Where we felt rejected, you come to fill us with acceptance. Where we feel despondent and depressed, you come to fill us with joy. So Holy Spirit, these ones that have placed their hands on their hearts right now, Lord, come and fill the empty place. Come on in faith. Say, I receive. Come on, say it again. Say, I receive. Thank you, Lord, right now, Holy Spirit, all over this place. Be filled. Joy, hope, strength, clarity. God has a great plan and purpose for your life. Be filled. Even if it's not with the answer right now, be filled with the sense of destiny, of worth of being loved. Be filled with the joy, even in the midst of sorrow right now. Be filled in Jesus' name. He emptied that tomb so you could be filled. I speak life into you. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We receive that. God, we receive your forgiveness, your life, your fullness this morning. In Jesus' wonderful name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.